Amen. So we're still talking about faith in the book of Hebrews, and uh, I, I'm still wanting to share with you what I've been learning from uh, N.T. Wright's scholarly book on Paul, which is uh, quite massive, and so it, it's been a new way of thinking about things, and <clears throat> uh, I want to explore some more. Uh, the relationship between faith, as I talked about it last week, is having a view of what God is up to and uh, what difference is it supposed to make in our lives? What, what's the relationship between faith and, say, faithfulness? So, but just by way of review, one of the problems that we have in terms of thinking about faith is we're sort of locked into a, a, an understanding of the cosmic dilemma that comes to us throughout the centuries, our understanding of that cosmic dilemma is how will people be saved? And the traditional under, you know, answer to that is through faith in Christ. But Paul perhaps didn't see that as the problem. I mean, certainly it's part of the problem, but it's not the problem. And, and I'm just going to go through these bullet points. Um, the, the scripture verses are here for you to look at later if you want to do some more expo exploring. But God made a promise that is a, a covenant with Israel to rescue them, to bless them, and through them, the whole world. But Israel was faithless to their commission. And that raises the question, well, is God unfaithful? And Paul's answer to that is emphatically no. Paul, and particularly in Romans, has set up this sort of argument in two, chapters 2, 3, and 4, with chapter 3 being the, the crucial one where he, he's saying, you know, no, God is not un, unfaithful. Why? Because God has made good on his promises through Jesus the Messiah. Now, this is how that works. As the Messiah, Jesus is the representative Israelite. And so the promise that God made in the Old Covenant was to rescue and bless Israel and through Israel, the whole world. So the through Israel part is being fulfilled because Jesus is the Messiah. He is the representative Israelite and he is the faithful Israelite. Of course, he's also God. And so God, quite literally, is working through the Messiah to rescue Israel and the world. And as evidence for this, as evidence to say, you know, well, how do you know Jesus is really the Messiah? Paul points to, well, his passion and his death and his resurrection. So that's the, the flow of the dilemma and the answer to the dilemma from Paul's point of view. So let me turn now to part two. This is also going to have some review uh, to it. And I put it as, as a sort of Q&A about faith and faithfulness. And the first question is, what has changed as a result of this problem and the solution, as I've just laid it out from Paul's point of view? What has changed as a result? And the answer is, the faithfulness of Christ has replaced circumcision as the sign marking out those who benefit from God's covenant justice. That's N.T. Wright's fancy way of saying, covenant justice is N.T. Wright's fancy way of saying that God made good on his promises. The faithfulness of Christ has replaced circumcision. Now anyone who's read Paul's letters knows that he spilled a lot of ink on the subject of circumcision. Uh, and namely, that, that's out. But what has replaced it is not our faith in Christ, but the faithfulness of Christ. That's what, that is, is what has replaced it. Uh, this is Paul's primary uh, argument in both Romans and, say, Galatians, that uh, the faithfulness of Jesus has replaced circumcision, and it has become the new way that people are marked. And people who believe the gospel, that is, the, the good news that God raised Jesus from the dead, are the benefactors of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. 
Okay, what does faith in the gospel mean? What does it mean to believe in the good news that God raised Jesus from the dead? Well, let's start with what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean have a conversion experience, as wonderful as that can be. It doesn't mean believing in a set of propositions about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, as important as our thinking about God is. I happen to love theology. That's what we call thinking about God. It's not that those things are unimportant. But faith means, faith means seeing God in his kingdom, this view that's made possible through the faithfulness of Jesus, and sharing in that faithfulness. The logic here is, in Paul's mind, Jesus was faithful, and therefore faithfulness is now the mark that, that if you will, it's the badge that marks out God's followers. It marks out people of the new covenant. It marks out the people who have been rescued and blessed Israel and the whole world. Now, I've anticipated at this point that perhaps your next question might be, huh? What am I getting at? What's the relationship between this faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Christ? What is the relationship between having the view of God that we are given in Jesus through his faithfulness and sharing in that faithfulness. What does that mean? And the answer is that the view that Jesus gives us results in faithfulness the same way that viewing the impending arrival of a very important day causes you to alter your life to be ready for that day when it comes. So, the gospel lesson. Here's Jesus saying, well look, you, you look at the sky and you can tell a storm's coming. Implicitly, it's, and you change what you're going to do as a result. You, you feel the wind now is coming from the south, you know a scorching heat's coming. You change as a result. How can you not see what's going on and or how do you see what's going on rather and then decide, well, nothing, nothing's changed. I don't need to do anything to change. You hypocrites. How can this be possible? How can it be possible that you can see all this and just walk away as if nothing has changed as a result? And that's the thing is that, I mean, consider our own lives. There are all kinds of things that when we see them coming, it changes us. You know, you're gonna close on a new house. You're not going to just act like nothing's happening, or a baby's coming, or it's, you know, your child's first day of school, or it's graduation day, or you got a new job, or, you know, a whole list of a thousand things that when we see them coming, we change our lives as a result. It isn't a matter of, uh, well, I have to think right thoughts and have a certain way of believing. It's like, you know, it's coming, so you change as a result. Seeing these things changes us. Perhaps this is where the language of being transformed by Jesus comes in. We're transformed because of the image that we are given of God. So maybe you get it and I should end the sermon at this point, or maybe I should say more. And I'm a preacher, so I'll say more. Think of it this way. Seeing God in his kingdom, this view that we're given, isn't given to us just to make us feel good. It isn't given to us just so that we can have some idea of who God is and feel better as a result. It isn't about, you know, knowing we're going to go to heaven when we die. It's not that those things are unimportant, but that's really not the point. The point is that you've been given an image of the plans and purposes of God in Jesus Christ. And now your whole life has to change as a result. As Paul put it in Ephesians 1, we, uh, Jesus has made known the mystery of God's will. And now having seen this will, you go about doing that will on earth as if you were in heaven. 
Or think of it this way. You know all of this. You see all of this. You see this, uh, where history itself is headed. And you decide, well, you know, I don't think it's all that important. Well, to borrow language from Jesus, that's like saying that you know the day and the hour when your house is going to get robbed, but you say, well, I made plans to go to the movies that day, so I'm going to keep them. Or you've been given responsibility for your best friend's wedding reception, who's out of the country, so it's all up to you, but your friend is delayed and unable to communicate with you, and when no one shows up at the appointed hour, you just pack up and leave. How can this happen? How could you do this? What is the view that we're given? Think of all the teachings of Jesus. Imagine Jesus uh, prefacing every teaching with the kingdom of God, the view that I'm giving you of the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a party being thrown for a good-for-nothing son who shamed his father, squandered his inheritance, and then had the gall to come home. Or it's like a full pardon being given to a guy whose whole life has been spent robbing and betraying his own people on behalf of a foreign government. Zacchaeus. It's like forgiveness being handed out like candy to prostitutes and crooked politicians. I mean, blah, blah, blah. It goes on. All of these things are the view that we've been given. Not to, to say nothing of the passion and death of Jesus himself. This is the view. How can you go on as if everything's normal? The, kingdom, the, the view of the kingdom of God that I give you is like everything you know about life is being turned upside down and backwards. Where now the world that God brings is one where the first are last and the last are first. Where if you really want to be somebody, you have to become no one where the highest place of honor is the place of a slave. These are the views of the kingdom of God that we've been given. You've been shown the whole thing. This is like saying, this is where history's headed, folks. One day, the kingdom of God's gonna arrive. It started in Christ, we continue to build for it, and one day it's gonna come. How, do you, how can you go on and act as if nothing has changed? You don't act that way when you see a storm coming. You don't act that way when you know a baby's coming or your child is graduating or you're getting a new job or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why would you do it now? You hypocrites. How can this be possible? You don't possess trust in knowing graduation day is coming. You know it's coming. You don't possess trust that you've got a new job. You know you've got the new job and you know when you start. If this were a Geico commercial, now I imagine at this point, you know, someone walking around as if nothing in the world has anything to do with him or her. You know, you know imagine someone looking out the window, it's raining, ah, oh, I think I'll wear shorts and short sleeve shirt and just go out. Doesn't matter. I mean, just you let your mind go wild. And they, the voiceover would be, if you're a fool, you act like nothing matters. It's what you do. But if you're a Christian, you go and love and serve the Lord. It's what you do. If you're a Christian, it's not, and you believe this, 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 and this. Not that that's unimportant, but that's not what it is. It's to love and serve the Lord. It's having seen this view of the kingdom, now working to bring this view to a reality, at least where you are and the people who you are with, you live with, you interact with. It's everywhere we go, making and living God's will on earth as in heaven. It's having seen this view, knowing in an instant your passport no longer says United States, it says Kingdom of God. And as a result, you live as a citizen of that country on earth. And now these, these verses today, at least as I'm looking at them, make a whale of a lot more sense. 
the gospel, or even as Hebrews put it, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God, right, excuse me, right hand of the throne of God. In other words, in light of the view that Jesus gives, coupled with centuries of faithful witnesses, how can I live as if nothing has changed? I've been shown where all of history is headed. The race is on, and I'm changed as a result. Amen.